Hello, everyone. Welcome to One Mind Brainwaves. I'm Brandon Staglin. Psychedelic science is on the rise. Clinical trials of mind-altering compounds are being conducted at major universities all around the country and the world. And many of these mind-altering substances like psilocybin or MDMA are showing great promise to actually address very hard to treat conditions like obsessive compulsive disorder or major depressive disorder or even post-traumatic stress. And this promise or this potential is actually giving a lot of hope to many patients who have not felt hope for many, many years. So one of today's guests is committing to is committed to providing exactly such hope for people. She is the co-founder of Compass Pathways. And she's on a mission to develop new therapies that can change the face of mental health treatment for the better. But first, what is it like to actually experience psychedelic therapies? What is the process like of participating in clinical trials? And, and what about the results? So with us today to start out our conversation is someone who's participated in a Yale University psilocybin clinical trial. Uh, psilocybin is a compound found in magic mushrooms and it's a psychedelic medication. Um, and this clinical trial is for patients with OCD. So Ben, welcome to Brainwaves. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Great, great to see you. Um, and viewers, thank you as well for watching today. Feel free to post any comments in the chat feature or any questions as well uh, of this webcast as you watch. As well, if you know of anyone who might benefit from the information we're sharing today in our, our webcast, please share this video with them. So Ben, um, so thanks for being willing to share your experience with us today. I know you've, you've gone through a lot and, and have experienced some psychedelic therapies using a, this clinical trial. I'd love to hear more about this. Uh, let's start from the beginning. Um, you've lived with obsessive compulsive disorder for quite a long time. When did you first start experiencing the challenges associated with OCD and how did that affect your day-to-day -day life? Yeah, my parents started observing abnormal behavior as young as four or five. I became cognizant of it starting around the age of eight or 10. And you know, when I look back at what the symptoms were at school age, I'd be the last child left at school because I couldn't pull myself away from my locker because I would be consistently convinced that I had somehow forgotten a book that I needed in order to perform my homework and whatever tasks I had to do that evening. As I'd be reaching for a book, I'd put it in my bag and I'd suddenly think, well, what if as I was reaching for it, I accidentally put it back? Is it really in my bag? Is it still in my locker? I really couldn't ever trust my senses when it came to input around events like that. And so I'd get caught in loops for minutes, sometimes longer uh, hours <laughs> it's been, uh, where I really couldn't extricate myself from the situation. And as you're stuck in that, you the anxiety builds around that event and you develop rituals to convince yourself that you performed the task successfully. Uh, and so it was difficult to really unravel at a young age what exactly was going on. And as I got older, the symptoms evolved and changed over time to be you know, a variety of more adult-oriented problems, not being able to leave my computer at the end of the workday, for example, uh, being convinced that I couldn't take a full breath unless I was yawning uh, and trying to induce a yawn throughout the course of the day. Yeah, the list kind of goes on and on. And for everyone who suffers from OCD, it can be radically different, uh, which is why OCD can sometimes be hard to pin down from a therapeutic standpoint is... There's commonalities in what drives it, but the actual manifestation can be can be radically different from person to person. Uh, so it's really changed throughout the course of my life as well. Well, thank you for sharing that, Ben. Um, I, I think this will resonate with many viewers who experience OCD. Uh, to be honest, it does resonate a little bit with me. Um, I experienced some OCD-like symptoms as a result of medication I was taking years ago for my own schizophrenia, uh, things like... Um, having to walk the same path many, many times to make sure I, I didn't do it wrong and um, uh, things like that. Uh, so I can see from your perspective as well, it, it must be very challenging to go through these symptoms. Um, but how difficult was it for you to get a diagnosis? And to what extent did that diagnosis help you to access uh, helpful treatments for the OCD? It was fairly easy for me to get a diagnosis. I think given my symptoms, you know, most clinicians would kind of snap their fingers and say, aha, you know, classic OCD. 
Uh, actually getting help is, is far more difficult. In terms of what's available, when I was younger, the standard was really cognitive behavioral therapy. Now it's accept acceptance and commitment therapy. All of those can help to some extent, but you have to be in a position to be able to put in the work comfortably and to make progress. And often a combination of SSRIs kind of dampening and turning down the volume on the symptoms, plus some of these therapeutic methods can actually be very effective. For me, it gave me a little bit of a toolkit for a brief period of time in, in my teens where I was able to go off med medication and feel comfortable. But honestly, uh, in terms of lasting help, uh, it just represents too much of a daily struggle to be able to put in the level of effort required to actually get on top of those symptoms, to get on top of OCD and feel like you're winning that battle. Uh, it, for me, at least, it would have been more time than would have been possible with a full-time job and you know family relationships and friends. And so you let it slide because it's actually sometimes easier to deal with the anxiety and the symptoms than it is to try to fight them. Gosh, I, I, I feel for you. I have similar experience as well, managing my, the anxiety I experienced due to my schizophrenia. Um, for example, uh, I try to meditate every day, play my guitar every day, but I don't have always time to do that. If I try to cram it into my day, then I get more anxious, you know, because I don't have time to do the things that I really need to do sometimes. So, um, yeah, I'm with you on, on, the, on the challenges of managing a health condition in an efficient way. Um, so how did you find out about this study at Yale and what made you want to participate in it? Yeah, I've been, you know, looking for alternative treatments. I was interested in meditation and mindfulness and trying to really look for everything I could possibly find that could be helpful to just moderate my mental condition. And uh, my wife actually works at Yale and was familiar with a research group that was doing some research in psychedelics and depression and OCD. And through that, I started Googling around and actually found the study at Yale. And because I'm, I'm fairly local, I was able to go in and, and meet with Dr. Kelmendi, who was running the study, and learn a little bit more about it. So, Well, that's great. I'm glad you found it. Um, did you uh, well, first want to little, learn a little bit more about the trial itself? You know, every trial is conducted a little differently from other trials. Can you talk a little bit about the screening procedures for uh, potential patients for the trial you're in? Sure. Yeah. I, at least I felt like it was fairly narrow criteria. I was pretty certain after my initial meeting that either I wasn't going to make it or uh, maybe just wasn't up for it uh, generally. But uh, there's a obvious criteria in terms of OCD severity level. It needed to be within a certain range with a certain amount of time per day really dedicated to performing OCD related tasks or rituals or loops. Uh, and so there was a pretty heavy screening process for that. Uh, part of it was also a pa looking for patients who've been treatment resistant in the past. So someone who's been on SSRIs and off and felt like it really wasn't a good treatment for them for whatever reason. And so feeling like the conventional methods of treating OCD were just really either not working out entirely or just not getting the patient as far as they needed to. And I ended up fitting the bill for, for both of those, which surprised me in some ways, but uh, ended up being very fortunate. Uh, that's good. It's it's kind of paradoxical. I mean, it's it's good that you are um, having challenges that were hard enough that qualified you for the trial, and hopefully the trial has helped you to uh, come through those challenges. But we'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, did you have any hesitancy or, or any thoughts of stigma uh, surrounding joining the trial when you first looked into it? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> it's you know, on paper, it's pretty wild. Uh, it's not. It's not something that we talk about a whole lot, uh, either in terms of just general mental health. I've been very closed with OCD, and it's it's um, a condition that actually allows you to be very closed about it. Uh, I think only people who have really lived with me are aware of the extent to which it affected my daily life. Um, so there was that aspect, and then the psychedelic aspect, which you know is has a lot of connotations and baggage, which we're starting to, I think, as a culture, unpack and realize that. You know, maybe the 60s did a disservice culturally to uh, a lot of what our perception around psychedelics means. But for example, I you know, going into the study, I was comfortable telling my parents I was participating in an inpatient OCD study. I did not tell them what it entailed. Uh, and so that's some of the obvious nervousness around it. Um, but actually, it was 
my wife who really encouraged me to pursue this. Um, she is a scientist and she really felt like there's an opportunity to contribute to the research, even if it didn't end up being personally advantageous for, for me, if, even if I was part of the control group and uh, nothing happened. So that really put me over the edge with her encouragement. Oh, that's great. It's great to have that support in your family from your wife. And did the aspect of contributing to science and helping other people also serve as a factor for you? Yeah, because it's double blind and it, part of the study did allow you to actually come back if you were in the control group and be treated with the drug at a later date. Um, but it's really a process to take five days inpatient. And uh, I had to feel to make it worthwhile for myself, like I was making a contribution to other people like me, if not necessarily myself. And you know, being local and being able to contribute, um, it, it felt important in a way. And I didn't want to let that importance just slip by. That's great. And you're continuing to contribute today through doing this webcast, helping other people learn about what you've gone through and uh, maybe learning about it, uh, um, inspiring them to learn more about it for themselves if they're going through something similar. Um, so when you started the trial, what was the dosing regimen like? How is it, how is it administered and, and how are patients monitored uh, during the trial? Sure. So every trial works a little differently. The way this one worked, like I said, five days inpatient with actually just one dosing session on the third day. And so two days of prep dosing session on midweek on Wednesday, and then two days of kind of unpacking and, uh, and surveys. I had been working with two people from the study for several months who actually did the initial questionnaires to figure out suitability and participation. And so I had a relationship with both of the people who were guides in the room with me at the time. So I felt very comfortable uh, actually with the people who were sitting for me. Um, it was administered with a little blue pill in a bowl that was handed to me. And I was actually given a moment to decide when and how to take it. Um, so there was a chance to kind of reflect and compose myself before going in. <laughs> um, and then I was encouraged to lay down with a headphones and a blindfold. Uh, it's a very comfortable room, a very comfortable space. Um, they really kind of part of the whole experience is holding space for the person who's undergoing whatever they're about to undergo. And so I felt like I was in a place where I could let go of things, uh, but in a medical setting. So I was wearing a heart rate and blood pressure cuff uh, where I was actually being monitored. And I was worried going in that that would actually provide a distraction. But uh, the day of, it felt almost reassuring that no matter what happened, there were medical professionals who were monitoring my well being. And that gave me more freedom to feel like I really could let go because nothing could potentially go wrong. It sounds like a very reassuring environment, very comforting environment that you were in. It, it was. Um, in stark contrast, I would say, to where I was staying for the rest of the week, which was you know, very clinical, very medical, unadorned room. And so even just that contrast made it feel like I was suddenly in a much more comfortable space. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Um, what was your experience like while you were actually using the medication? Well, this is, this is one I could talk about for a while. It's very difficult to put these types of experiences into words, um, but I'll do the best I can to summarize. Uh, at, at first, I, I felt really nothing. I conversed with the guides about some of the topics we talked about during our preparatory sessions, uh, essentially trying to get at the root cause of whatever the OCD had kind of emerged as a coping mechanism for. And so you go in with a set of intentions and we started talking about it at the beginning of the session. I started to feel a little bit spacey at one point and remarked on it and encouraged me to, to lay down and actually put on the blindfold and the headphones. Um, and I started immediately just having visions of things that were completely unrelated to what I was seeing in the room or really thinking of and was immediately compelled towards, you know, going in, I had a couple of thoughts that, boy, I really hope my session doesn't touch on these things. These are really terrifying for me and immediately just went right there. And uh, I, I began to see an old classmate who had, who had died tragically and actually felt myself die with him. And I, I watched as my entire sense of self shrunk down into a tiny dot, uh, really something like the essence of like the purest sense of who I am as a person 
and then disappear completely. And, and for some time, I experienced nothing, really a total absence of feeling of experience or of self. I know it seems wild to actually describe that, but the guys later reported I was simply weeping the entire time, but I, I have literally no memory of it. I experienced total nothingness. Mm. And when I came to some time later, I, I was in a place outside time and space, held in stasis by some type of entity. It, it felt sort of like a, like a cosmic waiting room <laughs> in a way, if I had to describe it. And I was put back into my human body, which I felt die and decay and waste away to literal nothingness and dirt. And out of that dirt, I grew into a small beech tree at the intersection of some trails near my house. And I actually felt myself grow, extend branches and leaves. And I felt sunshine and whole seasons pass. Uh, it was fairly extraordinary in terms of time dilation, but I didn't experience time passing as a person. I experienced it as a, as a tree would. And so I think somehow my perception of that felt reconciled. Somehow that was possible. And I saw, I saw myself as a tree, watch my human self uh, walk by with my family and my wife, my son, my dog. My son grabbed a branch and twisted it and pulled off a leaf. And as I watched them walk away, I made a choice to re-enter my human body. And when I came back, everything felt new. I had to learn how to walk, how to breathe, how to move my hands and my feet. Uh, it was it was basically a total fresh start, a re-entry into you know what I am physically. And I could go on. There were a number of other short episodes, but that's really the general arc of the experience. If I had to put it in a nutshell. <laughs> Uh, wow, uh, what a fascinating experience you had, and you just glow when you're talking about it. I mean, it's it sounds like a, a really um, revelatory or, or, or life changing experience for you. Um, in addition to the um, the things that it it, it kind of evokes uh, from potentially your 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 past or um, or things that you've seen or experienced earlier in your life. Um, did did the therapist who was monitoring you talk about the experience with you or did he just let you interpret it for yourself or how did that work? As it was happening, I, I wasn't articulating anything. I was completely uh -huh. just locked in my own mind and, uh -huh. and on a different plane, so to speak. When I came back, I began to slowly kind of re-inhabit my body. And as I began to speak, I started trying to explain what had happened. And I remember the guide saying, well, you don't have to explain this to us. You can just continue being in the experience. You know, we'll talk about this later. And I, my, my retort to that was, but I need to practice speaking. You know, let me practice speaking to you. I need to, I need to relearn how to do this. Uh, so it was almost as I was in the tail end of the experience, wanting to come out of it and wanting to relate it. There was a really powerful urge to, to communicate that. Uh, but they really did encourage me to try to soak up as much as possible during wow. the course of the session itself. Sounds amazing. Sounds totally amazing. Um, so, and the results, how did it change your symptoms and what kind of a difference did it make in your life? And when did you begin noticing the difference? Yeah, I began noticing the difference the next morning. Uh, the only way to really describe it is my old habits and behaviors felt vestigial, uh, really like an appendage that didn't make any sense anymore. Uh, so I, I had made this conscious choice to re-inhabit my body, but my brain was holding on to all of these patterns that no longer really made sense to it. And so as each symptom came up, I was able to just, I took it at face value, realized it no longer applied to me, and they just fell away. One by one, just, just fell away. And it, it ended up taking weeks for certain scenarios to occur. So the symptoms tied to particular objects or that were just less common for me. And so the things that came up immediately, like the breathing issue happened once it made no more sense and it went away It hasn't <laughs> come back. And it, it was, you know, these things, just little gifts that kind of appeared over days and weeks. And it came to a point where I really felt like after encountering these once I was completely OCD free. I mean, I went from, you know, the, Y box score is sort of the 
one of the standards for measuring severity of OCD. And I went from something like a 25 to, to a zero, uh, <laughs> which is pretty phenomenal. I mean, I, I don't know how else to describe it. I hate, I hate saying this feels like a miracle cure because it's not for everyone. And there's obviously there's, mm-hmm. there's challenges to working through it. But in my case, I really, I'm pleased to report that it, it managed to just radically change my life. Uh, there's no other way to put it. That's just what an incredible journey that you've experienced there. And it sounds like, um, you know, in losing yourself for a while, you you found control or command of your life again. That's just my interpretation. How, how, do, how do you interpret that experience and, and why it had the effect for you? Yeah, if I had to try to summarize you know, effectively, it was was a deep and genuine acceptance of my own emotional state. And and Uh going going through this difficult process of delving into my own fears, you know, around a lot of the things we typically cling to as as people with life and death being kind of the first and foremost, I could live as something without that complexity and shed that to be a tree to die to experience this to truly, truly let go. And then to come back with this clean emotional slate where I was willing and open and knew that it wasn't a tragic event to feel the worst thing that you could feel and to feel it deeply and completely. And so by moving forward and allowing myself to just have these emotions and to let them flow through me and to feel what they actually mean instead of providing cover for them through Mm. OCD, uh, you know, I'm developing real coping mechanisms for the first time in my life. Instead of leaning <laughs> on OCD as the only coping mechanism, I'm actually able to cope with emotions, which is wonderful. So that's, you know, if I had to pull it apart, that's kind of how I would um, describe the benefit of that. But it, I truly believe it works differently for, for everybody who goes through an experience like this. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing what you have learned for yourself from this experience. And uh, hopefully it will inspire others um, to know that there is hope for them too. Um, What words of hope do you have for others who might be experiencing what feels like unmanageable mental health challenges, such as severe OCD? Well, if you'd asked me before the study, I really never thought that I could actually feel this way. And so being on the other side is a condition that I thought was impossible. And now I know it's possible. And I believe that it's possible both with and without the kind of chemical help that I had during the course of this study. And the experience that I had isn't unique to a psilocybin experience. It's, you know, there are spiritual and just general mindfulness techniques that can help you engage in something that's very, very similar, if not identical to what I experienced. And so what it really provided was this hard reset, like I said, an opportunity to step away from all the trappings of life that get in the way of being able to address this head on, to truly sit with it and to make you open and willing to confront those challenges. And so it can happen, it, it is possible. And I think it's possible through a lot of different means. Um, I had a, a one week where I actually relapsed. I began to feel OCD symptoms coming back And it was an incredibly stressful time in my life. And those coping mechanisms began to reappear. But by immediately realizing that and leaning back on this experience, I was able to just nip it in the bud and Mm -hmm. push back against that and to move on. And that was actually great reassurance to know it wasn't some one-time chemical treatment that cured me and maybe it could come back at any minute, but actually it's a toolkit that you develop and that you can lean on and that you can come back to and you can carry forward with you. And I I think for others who are struggling, by working and building that toolkit, you can actually continue to lead a healthy life despite whatever challenges might come your way. And so it's really really about building that muscle. I love that, how you've described that. And when you talk about in terms of, it sounds like metacognition, the ability to step back and observe how you're feeling and what you're experiencing and what that means to you. And then uh address it in in a rational way that makes sense to you as an individual um it's a great tool that i I try to apply as well and it seems like a key um to to personal growth in so many ways so so thank you for sharing all all 
great experience that you've shared today. Um, it is, it's truly inspiring to me and uh, hopefully to our viewers as well. Thank you for joining us and sharing your insights. And I wish you the best in your ongoing uh, life and, and recovery. And um, yeah, I hope we can talk again someday. Thank you so much. As do I. Really appreciate you having me here. Likewise. Take care. Our next guest is the Chief Innovation Officer and co-founder of the metal health care company Compass Pathways, Ekaterina Malievskaya. Katya, thank you for joining us on Brainwaves. It's good to have you with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Indeed. Yeah, thanks for being with us. And, and I really do appreciate Compass's support for uh, and sponsorship of our 2022 One Mind Compass Rising Star Award. Thank you. Yeah, it's our pleasure and honor. Wonderful. Um, viewers, don't forget, we want to hear from you as well. Uh, if you have any thoughts, questions, or comments, feel free to post them in the chat section of this webcast at any time. If you know of anyone who might benefit from the information we're sharing in our show today, please share the video with them. Thanks. So Katya, um, shall we jump right into our, our questions, our conversation? Yeah. Let's okay. do it. Good, let's do it. So, um, so psychedelic science is an incredibly fast moving area of psychiatric science. Every you turn, you seem to see or hear accounts of the potential of psychedelic treatments to address really hard to treat uh, conditions for people who are struggling. And these are often fueled by really positive firsthand accounts of people who've used such, such therapies. Um, why, why do you think there's so much unvarnished optimism about psychedelic therapies? Um, I think it's a combination of really promising signals from research, uh, as well as individual experiences. Um, you know, psychedelics offer this unique experiences, facilitate this unique experiences that, you know, people value and remember. Um, so, um, but that's different from um, having evidence, having data. And so that's what I want to focus on. Um, there has been a resurgence of serious academic research uh, of psychedelics and their therapeutic potential for uh, a range of mental uh, illnesses, uh, serious mental illnesses like uh, treatment resistant depression, OCD, body dysmorphic disorder, eating disorders. Some of these disorders don't even have any approved treatments. So having something that could potentially be helpful is incredibly exciting for the field that hasn't seen much innovation for a long time. And uh, there, on top of this, you know, kind of evolving scientific field of psychedelic research, uh, there are a number of companies that are pursuing it in a, you know, with a goal to bring, to develop these treatments, to bring them to patients, bring them to market. And that is a slightly different task for, um, uh, you know, to bring treatments uh, to market. There is a difference between academic research and kind of commercial uh, approach to it. Um, and I think what we need to understand when we think about this research, uh, nothing will work for everyone. You know, that um, they, there will always be people who will benefit from it, but all, also there is a group of people who, or patients who would not have, um, you know, desired effects or will have adverse effects. And that's what the research is trying to understand who will benefit, who, um, uh, how would we know uh, this group of people and prioritize them? So this is, um, this is, I think, a very interesting area of research because I think psychedelics are not only therapeutic tool, but could also be used for as a research tool to understand and find new therapeutic targets, for example. Oh, wow. That is fascinating. And it sounds like uh, one of the goals is not just to develop new therapies, but to develop new precision ways to prescribe these therapies based on each individual's biological or experiential makeup uh, and their condition as unique to yes, them. Absolutely. Yeah. This is the way to, yeah, this is the way to take a deeper look, uh, you know, develop insights into the mechanisms of disease to, um, uh, you know, for example, the question why psilocybin seems to work uh, or prom uh, you know, offers promise to seemingly 
uh, you know, separate diseases like treatment resistant depression and OCD or anorexia, you know, clinically, they're very different, distinct clinical categories. So there, there is obviously a common mechanism that psilocybin addresses. And, uh, you know, looking at that, um, could be very interesting and would allow us to develop treatments, not only psilocybin itself, but novel treatments if we know uh, about no novel therapeutic tar uh, targets. This really is fascinating. Thanks for explaining all this. Um, and, and talking about the science, you know, Compass has been undertaking one of the largest clinical trials ever of psilocybin for treatment resistant depression. And um, you presented about that recently at the American Psychiatric Association's annual meeting. Can you please share a bit about the findings of that trial and how it was conducted and what the data is showing based on the, the evidence? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was the um, largest um, randomized control double-blind study of psilocybin in treatment resistant depression in patients with treatment resistant depression. Um, and you know, it's a huge unmet need, and treatment resistant depression is uh, depression that does not respond to, uh, in our case, to two, three, or four pharmacological treatments. Uh, and these patients suffer uh, enormously. So with each and every uh, failed treatment, uh, pharmacological treatment, their chances of responding or remitting following the next round of treatment uh, drops significantly. So it's it's a challenging group of patients, and it was very interesting to, um, uh, you know, to investigate in a rigorous uh, way whether psilocybin could offer help to these patients. And that was a um, 233 patients uh, randomized to low, medium, and high dose of psilocybin. And the goal of the study was to identify the dose that was the most effective and the best tolerated. And we had a clear winner. It was a 25 milligram group, the high dose. And uh, it showed that in highly significant reduction of symptoms, of depressive symptoms um, uh, at three weeks, that was the primary endpoint with a rapid and durable responses for up to uh, 12 weeks following one administration. So it was just one administration of psilocybin and 37% uh, of patients uh, had immediate significant reduction of symptoms. It's a very, uh, you know, very high number for this group of people. Um, and the difference between the doses, between the uh, different arms was highly statistically significant, as I mentioned, uh, with a change in MADRA score of 6.6. .6. It's a significant, uh, not only clinically significant, but it's a very, uh, um, it's a big difference in uh, reduction of MADRA score in absolute numbers. Um, and also, I think it was it's interesting to mention, as I said, that these patients, uh, patients who responded or remitted immediately after the dose, maintain the response or remission. Majority of patients maintain response or remission at twelve weeks, three months mm -hmm. after administration mm -hmm. of one dose. Uh, in general, it was uh, the COM three hundred and sixty was well tolerated. But one thing I wanted to mention, the other significance of the study that is not is often overlooked is that um, we recruited 25 different sites uh, in Europe and the US, um, and vast majority of these sites, if not every site, uh, has had never done research with psilocybin. The principal investigators, the study teams, the therapists were psychedelically naive in sort of research clinical setting. Uh, moreover, majority of patients were psychedelically naive. And the results that we demonstrated showed that the drug uh, has positive effect regardless of kind of personal convictions uh, of 
principal investigators, regardless of their, you know, lack of prior experience with psychedelic, psychedelics or psychedelic research, regardless of prior experience, patients' prior experience with psychedelics. And it also translated to different uh, settings. Uh, it could be an academic institution, it could be a, a private practice, it could be um, other settings. And also, uh, in I think it was in uh, 10 different countries, so several mm -hmm. languages, and uh, the, the treatment translated well across uh, a um, whole range of clinical care setting, settings. That is, that is so encouraging to hear. It sounds like it was completely um, unbiased, you know, throughout the results that it received in, in that it, there's so, such a diverse array of settings and so many of them were, had never used psychedelics before, had no preconceived notions about it. Uh, that, that sounds like a really watertight set of data that you have there. That, that's wonderful. And uh, the 37% of the people who used it in that high dose arm were uh, helped by it significantly. That's really encouraging to hear. And I'd be curious, you know, for future uh, maybe if we do another interview in the future, I'd love to, um, talking about like what you learned about uh, why the other two thirds weren't affected. Like what, what is it about them and what is it about the people who were affected that because we talked about this precision medicine a moment ago, you know, did you? Absolutely. This is a, um, yeah, this, it, it is the most interesting question because when you look at the data, there's clearly uh, slightly more than 30%, uh, the, the one third of uh, people uh, responded and those who responded maintained response and remission. So it kind of self, you know, it's an, a, you know, clear group of people uh, who, uh, a, a, you know, group of responders, and then, you know, two thirds unknown responders, and they're just as interesting as responders. What is different about that group? Can we optimize their preparation? Can we optimize something in their, you know, mindset or in any other conditions leading to psilocybin session that would allow them to achieve response or remission after one dose? Something for future research. That would be wonderful Absolutely. to learn about as we go forward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so this is fantastic. Uh, and I can I imagine, and I've heard some of your story already about your family and so forth, but I want to ask you for our viewers, why don't you want to start Compass and what, uh, attracted you in particular to this area of psychiatric medicine? Yeah. So it was an involuntary startup, as I often say. So I'm a physician. I was trained in internal medicine and I was in private practice in uh, internal medicine, in academic medicine, you know, private practice in public health for many years in New York. And as an internist, I wrote a lot of prescriptions for antidepressants, but I kind of never appreciated what happened when, you know, patients refer to psychiatry. And only when we became on the receiving end of mental health care, uh, when my son uh, came down with depression and OCD and nothing was working, nothing was helping, uh, you know, we realized um, that, um, you know, we started talking to um, a lot of people and Everybody we talked to had a story. Everyone had a story. Everyone had someone in their family or themselves who suffered from, uh, you know, some mental health conditions, ineffective treatments, um, side effects, shame, isolation. Uh, I don't think I've met a single person who said, well, I don't have any experience with mental illness, but good luck to you. Uh, and I think that coupled with... Uh, kind of lack of access to uh, high quality mental health care, to lack of innovation, with lack of innovation, and this kind of ubiquitous um, silent epidemic of mental illness, kind of, we almost didn't have a choice. We wanted to, um, to change that. And when I, you know, started looking for solutions for my son, I found this research, uh, a paper on psilocybin in OCD, uh, when nine patients, it was University of Arizona, nine patients took, um, you know, pharmaceutical grade psilocybin and majority of them got better the next day. It was a short, uh, small study, but the signals were promising. And we started supporting research philanthropically. And then we realized that to bring these treatments to all the patients who need them, uh, the 
the academic research is just, you know, it, it's a different setting. It, it, you know, to bring the treatments to patients, it's a different set of skills. It's very complex and very expensive. And so that's how we started the company. Uh, not in service of psychedelics, but with a goal to transform patients' experience with mental health care. Mm, and that's fantastic. You've done so much great, had so much great progress since then. It's Thank been you. encouraging to see that. Um, I'm curious about the effects that psilocybin has on the brain. You as a psychiatrist yourself um, probably have some insight into this as well as having worked with it for a while. How does psilocybin work to help process thoughts? Uh, I wouldn't say that I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm an internist. Oh, okay. But, I'm sorry. You know, I can still read uh, scientific literature, and yeah, having been in this field, I can probably, you know, um, wing it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I uh, so uh, you know, uh, there is a mechanism of action, and there is a mechanism of change. So the mechanism of action is how cell seven works in the brain, in, in the body, right? It, it primarily works on the serotonin uh, system uh, that regulates uh, largely uh, mood, sleep, thinking process. Uh, and it, the kind of the serotonin receptors are, you know, spread throughout the body, but there is a high concentration of particular type of receptors, 5-HT2A receptors in the brain, in the system of functional connections called default mode network. And this is a, you know, system of connections that uh, is uh, responsible for planning, um, you know, contemplation, uh, self-reflection, uh, and this kind of system of connections uh, gets down regu regulated during the psilocybin session. A number of, you know, things happen. Uh, and, you know, one of them is this, you know, uh, experience, psychedelic experience, experience of unity, non-dual experience, um, blissful experience, you know, some researchers call it mystical, but I think it's more of a cognitive designation of the quality of the experience. But there is a particular type of experience that that correlates with better clinical outcomes and sustainability of the um, effects. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there is also a mechanism of change. What happens? So the, the patients are really um, active participants in uh, in this process. Normally in clinical uh, studies, we don't want sort of um, personal stories, individual kind of uh, variability, because it kind of, you know, uh, pollutes the, the quality of data. But with psychedelics, we just cannot look away, you know, from the quality of the experience and what, you know, the insights that patients generate, the uh, um, solutions for themselves. Uh, in, you know, in the process of a psychedelic session, uh, they have the ability to look at their personal narrative from a different perspective and generate insights and solutions that then after the session are more easily integrated and perhaps contribute to a change of unproductive behavioral, cognitive, emotional um, uh, patterns. Thanks for that explanation. And uh, despite my error in uh, characterizing your profession, you you wing that exceptionally well. Um, <laughs> really, really appreciate the explanation. That's so helpful. Um, and uh, thank you. So, um, and that fits with what you heard about from our, our previous guest, Ben. Uh, he described his experience very similar to how you just explained that. So, um, corroborates it beautifully. Um, so, are there any inherent risks of psilocybin use? And is it possible that the science might be moving too fast in some areas? And is there any possibility of dependence or overuse of psilocybin? And how can we safeguard against those risks? Well, the, the risk, there is always a risk, right? Uh, uh, anything that can help you can hurt you. And the difference between the, the medicine and the poison is the dose. And that includes the not only the dose, but also the pattern of use. So uh, uh, in terms of the risks, I think the most important risk is to screen uh, people uh, carefully um, before psilocybin session and to make sure that, you know, people with history of psychotic illness, schizophrenia, other psychotic disorders, um, you know, are not included in, uh, in the study. Uh, personality disorders, um, 
you know, other poorly understood mental, uh, mental health conditions, uh, this patient should not be part of, uh, you know, cell seven session, not because it's an absolute contraindication, but because we just don't know yet how to support them, uh, you know, in the sessions in a way that is most helpful to them and minimizes all the risks. Uh, and that I think is, you know, the biggest risk. The other risk I see is that under the sort of influence of psilocybin or psychedelics in general, people become much more open and suggestible to all the um, kind of influences. And so uh, there is a, um, you know, an issue of integration of how these patients are supported and what they're exposed to during the session that could influence the outcome. So by being so uh, suggestible, they become vulnerable to, you know, um, uh, you know, insights that sort of might not be true and we need to, um, uh, you know, help them uh, integrate them, uh, integrate this inside. So it's a, it's a delicate, it's a delicate state. And I think the quality of therapists who support patients in this or people in this, in the state is very, very important. So just like patients need to be screened carefully, therapists also need to be screened carefully and they need to be trained and they need to be, um, you know, supervised, supported, mentored, uh, and, you know, their professional growth needs to be, um, uh, you know, facilitated and, and supported. So I think those are two major risks. In terms of addiction or habituation, so, uh, you know, fortunately, when these drugs like MDMA and salsabin and other drugs um, were uh, criminalized, one good thing came out of it that uh, NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, uh, did a lot of research uh, studying, you know, so-called drugs of abuse. So they did a lot of research studying abuse potential. And, you know, there is essentially no evidence that these drugs are uh, cause physical dependence or, um, uh, you know, as I said, anything has a potential for misuse, but these are less, um, you know, um, uh, there, there is much less chance with psychedelics that they could be harmful in that way. I see. That's reassuring. And I'm glad that you have a, a, a clear handle on what it takes to make sure the patient's experience is, is as safe and effective as possible. Yeah. I'm sure you practice those throughout your clinical trials and, and so forth at Compass. That's great. Mm -hmm. Uh, speaking of Compass, and uh, one of the core values to Compass's approach is inclusivity. And when we talk about psilocybin therapies, how do we ensure that um, in terms of accessibility, affordability, and so forth, that we can make sure that they're used to, so to speak, democratize mental health care rather than wind up as more of a boutique or niche mental health solution? How do mm -hmm. we make sure they can reach the most people who need them? Yeah, absolutely. So we've been thinking about. Um, about that since the inception of Compass. It was our personal experience that, um, you know, particularly in the US, mental health care can be very, very expensive while remaining ineffective or harmful. So uh, access uh, has always been, um, you know, in the forefront of everything that we do. And we, to that extent, you know, one of our very first regulatory conversations, interactions was with uh, European regulators and payers. Uh, together, we had a four hour meeting, um, uh, what's called parallel scientific advice, when not only regulators, but payers come together to evaluate the potential of therapy and the potential of uh, including these interventions, these treatments into national healthcare systems, into healthcare guidelines. And the outcome of this meeting is the advice from payers, what evidence do we need to generate in order for them to consider cost effectiveness and inclusion of these treatments into national healthcare guidelines. And so uh, we did this in Europe and we have a very good understanding 
what we need to demonstrate in order to have conversations with payers and include it. Uh, and that way we can make it available to all patients, regardless of their ability to pay. And of course, in the US, we are focusing on conversations uh, with a multiverse of um, uh, payers. Uh, and uh, this is not for the faint hearted, but we are plowing through mm -hmm. and we're learning how to, you know, what payers are looking for. And uh, we are in ongoing conversations and all our clinical trial designs are informed not only by regulators, but by payers as well. Mm -hmm. So that is to ensure that this uh, these treatments, should the signs hold uh, and should the uh, regulators approve them, they become available to, uh, you know, in the inner cities, uh, uh, to uh, single parents on welfare, to, you know, through Medicaid, through Medicare and other, you know, um, other, you know, plans and that it's available to kind of marginalized and underprivileged population. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're also looking, of course, at the um, specific vulnerable groups. We're working with Emory University Grady Trauma Center to understand the needs and barriers for access uh, to psilocybin therapy in the inner city population in Atlanta. Uh, and we just finished the project with them and about to launch another one. Uh, we are looking at the uh, indigenous mental health and we're looking at immigrants' mental health. And there are, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of projects that just started and, you know, I'll probably be uh, able to share more, you know, later. But we're very excited uh, about uh, understanding the needs and path to care path to access for this specifically underprivileged population. Mm -hmm. I love your proactivity in this area of equity and access. Thank you for that. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it sounds like a beautiful vision that you are on track to achieve. So finally, speaking of vision, paint a picture for us of the future. What is, where is the science going? What are your goals and what gives you hope? Mm. Um, so our vision is uh, to bring mental health care on par with uh, other medical specialties in terms of uh, evidence-based solutions, evidence-led solutions. So uh, this is about you know, science and evidence generation and rigorous clinical trials. But in general, uh, I think for psychiatry is really important to move towards precision, predictive and preventative models of care. And that is a combination of, you know, science, public policy, you know, uh, public private partnerships, dialogues with uh, all stakeholders, uh, because, you know, what's unique about mental health care is it's not just the pill. You know, the whole ecosystem around the patients matter. Um, you know, Tom Insel just wrote a wonderful book called Healing, where he, uh, he is the person who spent 13 years leading National Institute of Mental Health, you know, chasing biomarkers and, um, you know, imaging. Uh, and yet he arrives to the conclusion that it matters how we support these patients, how we care for these people, in the community and what's available, uh, so it's a it's a complex uh, it's a complex task, and uh, our vision is that we need to develop all parts of this ecosystem, from science to access to community care to com uh, community support, uh, digital solutions. AI and machine learning uh, applications to understanding the state of mental health. So it all needs to come together. And uh, that's what we're working towards. I love that. And it fits for it so well with One Mind's vision as well. I'm so glad we can partner on these Rising Star Awards and look forward to our, as we are continuing collaboration. Well, well done so far, uh, Katya and to Compass Pathways. Uh, really impressed with what you are doing. Thank you. And thank you for spending time with us on Brainwaves today. Uh, really appreciate all of the insights that you've shared. They're so helpful to our viewers, I am sure. And viewers, thank you too. 
If you'd like to learn more about Compass Pathways and its innovative work, please visit compasspathways.com. If you'd like to follow uh, One Mind uh, and see all of our past Brainwaves episodes, please please check out onemind.org slash brainwaves. Uh, and remember, what is your brain good for? Making waves, of course. <laughs> Thanks for being on Brainwaves, and I'll see you next time. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Most of the time, I just want to lay in bed. I don't want to talk to people. Mental illness is the world's leading cause of disability. And right now, our mental health is being put to the test. Who is leading the discoveries to provide quality mental health care from the lab to the front lines? We are One Mind, accelerating brain health for all. Help us fund new treatments at onemind.org. I'm living my best.